Hi there. In the previous video, we talked about adding weights to losses manually. In general, we have algorithms that can produce some sort of loss that represents how well an algorithm can take a row of data and use it to predict a value that we are interested in. We also discussed how you can calculate such a loss for every single data point, and that there might be a use case to add a bit of weight to all of these separate losses. We might deem some data points to be more important than other data points, and by adding these weights, we actually gain a bit of manual control over that. This is a very general technique because the way algorithms work is that they take the sum of all of these losses, and that typically also means that they can account for whatever weight we are interested in passing along with it. What we also discussed is that there's a downside to this. After all, you could look at all of these weights as separate hyperparameters, and there is a risk that you don't really have a lot of control over how these will influence the algorithm besides just checking empirically. There's also a risk of underfitting certain regions in favor of other regions, so it's not necessarily a free lunch when it comes to these weights. However, what we could do instead is come up with some sort of a principled method to generate these weights on our behalf. It turns out that there sometimes are these use cases where we can very clearly describe a problem, which in turn we can very easily turn into a weighting scheme. In this video, I'm going to be discussing one such use case that it revolves around time series. There are also other problems and principled methods out there, but for time series in particular, there is actually a theme that seems somewhat general that might be good to discuss. So let's talk about one such a use case. I am back inside of a Jupyter Notebook, and I am using a utility function from the Scikit Lego package to generate a time series for me. It's not a whole lot of code, but the most important thing is just the shape of the time series that's being generated over here. On the x-axis over here, we've got the number of days since a event, let's say. And then over time, you can see that there's some sort of a pattern, and we might be interested in predicting this pattern. When you eyeball this, though, you might start to notice something. The pattern that we have a couple of years ago is a bit different than the pattern that we are seeing now. And this is something that's actually quite common in time series. The world definitely keeps on changing, and you could rightly wonder if it makes sense at all to use data from 10 years ago to predict what's happening today. Then again, it's not like there's no useful information here either. We have to remember that this is simulated data, but one theme that I could at least argue for here is that there is some sort of a seasonal pattern that does seem to repeat. There's a peak over here, and that peak is definitely followed by a flat bit and then a down bit, and that is something that really keeps on happening, at a regular interval, you could even say. So while it is the case that the scale of the seasonal effect a few years ago is different than the scale of the seasonal effect over here, it's not like the knowledge from a long time ago should be completely forgotten either. It's just that we want to have more weight, so to say, to the recent stuff, as opposed to the stuff that we've got over here. And there's also another way of perhaps thinking about it. There are five peaks in this data set. And we could wonder, well, what would the prediction be if we were to train on these five peaks? How might we predict forward? What would the prediction look like? Well, there's two small ones. There's two big ones. There's one in the middle. The model will typically prefer to do the average thing, so it wouldn't be that surprising if the peak that is being estimated would be the same height everywhere unless we have some sort of way to account for it. If we are really only making a model that does the seasonal prediction and doesn't do any projecting forward, then it wouldn't be that surprising that we end up with some sort of peak that's being estimated that has the same size everywhere, which means that in the early years we are overshooting, and then in the later years, we are undershooting, which will definitely be most pronounced in the most recent year. So hopefully, this is enough motivation to consider weighing what we see over here. We might be able to come up with some sort of general function that is going to look at the most recent point in time, and that's going to add some sort of a decay to the past. And if I were to just do a rough drawing, you might be able to draw something like, well, the most recent data point that has the highest weight but then we might be able to do some sort of a decay going back. And we can have a discussion about the shape of this curve. We could do something that is exponential. That's something we could do. 
We might also argue that instead having a decay that's a bit more linear could be a better idea. That's definitely a hyperparameter that you can consider in this system. But the more overarching, more meta observation here would be to say, we have a good reason, a good heuristic to generate these sample weights for ourselves. We can come up with a function that describes this line, and then all the sample weights that we generate can come out on our behalf. I figured I might give a small demo to show this phenomenon in action. And as luck would have it, the scikit lego package actually comes with an estimator that does precisely this. It is called the decay estimator. The way that the decay estimator works is you're able to give it a estimator, and then the decay estimator will wrap around it. And then you can pass some information that will generate the value weights internally, which will then apply to the estimator that you give it. If you want to learn more about the ways that you can decay these value weights, the documentation has a section where all the decay functions are being shown. There's a linear function, there's a sigmoid, there's also a stepwise method that you can follow. I'll just be using the exponential method that comes with a decay parameter that defines this shape. But definitely if you want to learn more, do check out the documentation page. There definitely is more than one way to apply this decay, but the assumption of the decay estimator is that we're dealing with time and that therefore the stuff that happened in the past is less interesting than the stuff that's been happening recently. Note, by the way, that if you are interested in using this because of that phenomenon, the algorithm does assume that the recent stuff is in the later bit of your data set. That is important to keep in the back of your mind because if your data set is not sorted, then this system may not work. Having said that though, let's look at the results. This is what the predictions look like. I have the original pipeline that doesn't have any decay in it. And you can also see that it does what we might expect. We are only estimating a seasonal pattern here and we are overshooting in the early years and we are undershooting in the later years. If we look at the decayed variant though, we can see that it's technically overshooting pretty much everywhere, except for the most recent year. And you might even argue that the decay rate is set in such a way that we are even still slightly undershooting over here, just because there's a lot of data to fit still from the past. Now, one thing to note is that even though this decay trick seems to have merit to it, you still gotta be a little bit careful, especially when you start interpreting these results. Let's pretend that we do cross-validation and that there's a bit of a cutoff over here. So everything on this side would be the train set, and then this side might be the test set. Doing cross-validation this way for time series makes a lot of sense, but you do get this awkward thing that is somewhat uncommon. Because of the way that we're doing this decay, it is actually a bit more normal that we are going to be overfitting on the most recent stuff, which also means that we are going to be underfitting on the far past, but there might be more data from the far past than from the more recent period. And that might mean that if we are going to be calculating summary statistics, that the performance of the train set is going to be worse, perhaps, than the performance of the test set. And that is something you typically never see in machine learning, but it is something you might start to see here simply because of the way that this decayed estimation works. I wanna be a little bit careful here when I talk about this decayed estimator. In particular, because this is from an open source package that I've helped maintain, and I don't wanna suggest that my work is particularly excellent. Having said all that though, what I do hope is that you're able to look at this chart and do feel a little bit of an appreciation of what the value weights allow you to do. They really can help you steer the algorithm in the right direction, even if there's still no free lunch. We can definitely tell ourselves that this green line over here is doing a lot of good work, but we shouldn't ignore that there are still some parts over here that don't get a very good fit. Probably because there's a region over here that gets way more value weight attached than the region over here. If you're interested in using this somewhat experimental estimator, you're definitely free to do so, but do be a bit careful and do your grid search and cross-validation properly. This technique is pretty sensitive to the decay rate that we set over here. And the main reason why I bring it up isn't really so much to promote the decay estimator, the main reason why I bring it up is to emphasize the point that the value weights that we're using under the hood, that they do give you a lot of control and there can be good reasons to consider them. There sometimes is this knowledge that you have from the domain that you can translate into value weights 
and that can make an algorithm more appealing to a use case. That is the main lesson of the decay estimator, more than the hyperparameter of the decay rate itself.